On today's newsmakers and actors, Mission for God, a Christian professor's victory, and revival in America, that and more coming up. Welcome to Newsmakers, a show where we go behind the headlines each week to bring you interviews with pastors, entertainers, politicians, and other notable figures. On today's Newsmakers, we begin with Dr. Johnson Varkey, a Texas college professor who fought back after claiming he was fired for reportedly being too religious. He joins the show today to talk all about winning back his job and fighting on for his religious freedom. Let's welcome Dr. Varkey to Newsmakers. Dr. Varkey, you just scored a major victory. You'll be returning to your classroom by the fall, which I'm sure is very exciting for you. But before we get into that victory, let's talk a little bit about the backstory. You ended up losing your position teaching at a college. What happened? Why were you removed from the classroom? This happened, uh, you know, I received a, a letter from uh, the Vice President of Academic Affairs uh, early 2023. It was in January that uh, they are doing a thick violation investigation on me. And uh, I asked him what was the reason and what were the complaints. He wouldn't give me an answer. But two weeks later, I received a termination letter and that letter doesn't explain the whole reasons behind my termination. So I assumed from his wordings that uh, I was re uh, doing religious preaching and I mentioned something against the homosexuals and all those. So I assumed that it would be something uh, related to my teaching on reproductive system uh, which was towards the end of that semester and when where four students walked out of my classroom. So I assume maybe that was the reason. I never received any uh, copy of any complaints at that time. I didn't receive any explanation. So that's what uh, triggered all these um, all these um, case and uh, uh, my response to that case and uh, I approach First Liberty to defend me and all those things happened after that. So you were trying to get an answer from them in the beginning of, okay, what is the reason for this? You know, I assume you enjoyed your job teaching, yeah. you know, you had given, given your perspective on, on something in the classroom there and students didn't like it if you walked out, but you were left to assume because they weren't being clear, correct, on what it was that led to this. That is correct. And uh, I was left to assume that and I received the actual complaint only in july or august which is almost six months later six seven months later than it, uh, terminating me and what did that official complaint end up saying did you get you know very specific information in there yeah it, it was the same as uh, my uh, termination letter that i was doing the some religious preaching which i never did in the classroom and also my made comments against the homosexuals and uh, some anti-abortion rhetoric and uh, jokes about women all those those were the complaints but i it never happened in the, my classroom you know, finding out that you were able to come to a settlement and agreement on this that would put you back in the classroom, what did that feel like when you heard that? Oh, yeah, I was so excited and I uh, thank the Lord for uh, uh, that outcome. And I am grateful to First Liberty, Kayla, and also to the Lord to put me back in classroom. Yes, I am excited to go back and teach that uh, be, I love to do. Yeah. Have you had, can, can I ask, have you had support at all from students and faculty in these situations you hear, obviously there are some, there were some who were apparently disgruntled or upset or, you know, but did you, did you receive support at all? Have you been able to communicate with anybody from the college community as this has been going on now for, for quite some time? Yeah, of course. I contacted some of my colleagues and uh, they were very supportive. And uh, of course I, I did not contact any students because I didn't, feel contact any students because it was the case was in the hands of first liberty and uh, first liberty was dealing with it so i didn't want to 
contact anyone. But of course, yeah, I saw some support from uh, my colleagues. Yes, I did. For you, was it difficult to make the decision to fight to get your job back? Would it have been easier to walk away? Talk a little bit about just your decision. And I mean, obviously, it's, it's paid off for you here. Yeah, because I didn't want to walk out because I did not do anything wrong in the classroom. I just said the truth and I still would stand for the truth. And uh, so I didn't want to walk out because there are many if I walked out of this, there could be uh, many other people going through the same situations, uh, falsely accused, and uh, they may have to, you know, swallow the repercussions. And uh, so I didn't want that to happen. So that's why I stood and I'm thankful for Versa Liberty for standing with me uh, in this whole time. And uh, the Lord gave us the victory. You know, final question for you, Dr. Varki, for any Christian out there who is scared to speak up, or maybe they're going through something similar where they feel like they've been unfairly targeted, what's your advice for them as they deal with some of the struggles and pain that can come along with that? Yeah, I would say don't quit, because there are people, there are people very supportive, just like First Liberties, and, uh, you know, stand for the truth, don't quit, because quitting is your you know, kind of a coward, you know, I would say that. And, uh, yeah, stand for the truth and to stand for the truth and don't quit. And people, there would be a lot of people supporting you. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time today, breaking down this important story and your victory. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a powerful message about standing up for truth in a chaotic culture. After the break, we'll talk with Brett Varvel, an actor on a mission for Jesus. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Our next guest is Brett Varvel. Now, the County Rescue star will share his faith as well as his journey into Hollywood. Let's welcome Brett to Newsmakers. So you play Andy in County Rescue. Take us through first your character, then we'll get into the premise of the show. Yeah, so Andy is a ball of joy. He's a little kid in a big boy's body. <laughs> um, he, lo- he loves life, he loves to pull pranks, uh, but above all else, he loves family, he loves community. And that really speaks in, into a lot of why he's chosen this path of being an EMT and wanting to save people's lives. But he really sees that group of EMTs at the station as as his people. And so he'll do anything for those people um, above all else and then puts himself in harm's way. He's a Christian. He uh, He's the captain of the EMT group. And so he at times does have to take on a little bit of a leadership role. But most of the time, he's just the the immature child of the group. The immature child of the group. So this is a medical show, right? Yeah. You mentioned being an EMT, playing an EMT. How is it different from some of the other medical shows that have been out there? I think the thing that we explore in this show that's maybe different from other medical dramas is that we go into the interpersonal workings of this this ensemble that we have on screen and we see real life questions. What do you do when you're trying to discover your purpose in life? What do you do when things don't go your way? What do you do when tragedy strikes? How do you cope with that? Who do you lean on? All of those different types of questions we explore with the faith element, with the family element, with there's even some romance. Um, and so it, it, I think it, what it does is it elevates these people who put themselves in harm's way every single day, risking their lives to save other people. Um, but at the same time, then we go back to the station. And then how do you deal with that? That's the horrors that you see. What, what? How do you process that that stuff that you go through on a day-to-day basis? And so um, the faith element is definitely a, a key component to the show, um, following the main character, Danny, as she's trying to discover her her purpose in life. What is she doing and what? how does she believe that God has called her to this? And um, how does she navigate that? So that's one of the main elements that I think separates County Rescue from other medical dramas. Well, in full disclosure, and you know this, last summer I did the after show did. with you guys. And so it was really interesting, though, sitting down. I wasn't sure what to expect. All of you together, you had been on set. It was kind of the towards the end of the yeah. shoot. And I've never seen a cast of people who were more friends. I mean, you guys were like family. It was like we you were. knew each other forever. What was that dynamic like on the set? It, it was electric. Um, I mean, 
there's there's a real thing called chemistry on set. I mean, you can't fake it, you can't fabricate it. Um, my first day on set, going into cast holding, we just clicked, all of us. Um, we really bonded really fast. And, and part of it, the way that they structured the shooting schedule was such that we were all needed on set almost every single day. And so we may only shoot one or two scenes in a given day for like my character only or whatever, but we're there all day with those people getting to know each other's uh, real life and their likes and dislikes. And, and then that started organically coming out on screen. And the, the affection that you see on camera was, was real. It was what we felt for each other in real life. Yeah. And that really came, that really came through. Yeah. Now, now you have been in the faith and family friendly space for a long time. Yeah. You've done a lot of projects and what is it about this space that's important to you? Why do you stay in it? I had an encounter when I was 18 years old. Um, I had entered a short film that I made into a statewide arts competition in Indiana, where I'm from. Uh, it was just a proclamation of what Jesus has done in my life. I've, I've been set free from my sin. I've been born again. And I created this movie and it ended up winning first place in the state of Indiana, which blew my mind. But then at the award ceremony, uh, my, uh, my film was playing and I heard about a janitor who peeked his head in and ended up giving his life to Jesus after watching my film. And it was like in that moment I saw you know, this, this new direction in life that God wanted me to go in, which was to take the talents and abilities that he's given me and to proclaim hope to people. And so from that, from that day forward, I've just really tried to commit my life and my career in service to him by, by taking the, the things that he's allowed me to, to do. I mean, I, I don't shy away from the fact that I get to do what I love to do, but I get to proclaim hope at a time and in, in a day and age in our world where there's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of loss. There's a lot of darkness. And we, like with a show like County Rescue, we get to bring hope into that. And that's why I love being a part of shows like County Rescue is um, it's not just inspirational. We, you, you can make people feel good, but then they don't necessarily go away changed or chewing right. on, a, on a nugget of truth. But in a show like County Rescue, there's a lot that the audience can wrestle with in a good way and give them a sense of hope and, and a, a new path in life, so to speak. There's a mission there. I mean, yeah. your, your work always has come with a mission. Absolutely. And not everybody can say that, no. right, in, in entertainment. And, yeah. or, or maybe there is a mission, but it's not the mission you well, have. Well, I, I think there is a mission yeah. in many ways. And, you know, whether it's good or bad, what I've always grounded myself in is I want to be about the truth found in God's Word, the biblical promises that we see that are going to lead us to hope and life and eternal life in Jesus. And, and that's why I love a show like County Rescue. Yes, it's fun. It's entertaining. It's got all, it's got, you know, the action and the suspense and the romance and the drama and the comedy. But at the end of the day, uh, and I can, I can attest this from just uh, watching some fan reactions of, of some early screenings. This show really, it really touches people's hearts in a deep way and causes them to really think and, and uh, evaluate who they are. Appreciate you joining us today and talking thank about you. your story. Yeah, thank you, man. Be sure to be praying for Brett and others working to have a positive witness in Hollywood. And you can check out County Rescue over at Great American Pure Flix. Up next, we'll talk with author and speaker Jenny Allen about her new book and revival in America. This is Newsmakers on the CBN News Channel. Welcome back to Newsmakers on the CBN News Channel. For our final segment, we are sitting down with Jenny Allen. Now, Jenny has witnessed some of the most powerful moments of revival over the past year. Let's talk with her about that and plenty more on Newsmakers. Well, Jenny, I'm excited to have you here. Your new book, Untangle Your Emotions, Naming What You Feel and Knowing What to Do About It. It's a great topic considering where we are right now culturally. Let's let's start with what you think, and I know this is a loaded question, but what you think Christians sometimes get wrong when it comes to emotions. Wow. Well, hello. It's so great <laughs> to meet you, Billy. Let's go. Um, yeah. I mean, first of all, we all get emotions wrong, right? We There's so much confusion around this subject. It's not just the church. It's certainly the world. You look at the world and and you see everyone obsessed with happiness to the point that they will drive their entire lives off a cliff to find it. And, you know, the Bible gets that. Actually, Paul in Corinthians even says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, basically, if this is all made up, 
eat and drink because tomorrow you die. Like go pursue your happiness. So if, if there is no God, we don't need to be too hard on the world because that's what they believe. And they are, you know, they are acting accordingly. So then let's go over to the church. So I think the church in large part has reacted to, in our generation, has reacted to culture and has just said, you know what, emotions are dangerous. If your emotions are in charge, then then you're going to lead a really reckless life. And and certainly that is true if they're in charge. But out of a pendulum swing reaction to the world, I believe the church has really not known what to teach about emotions. And so nobody really has a good working theology of emotions because we've demonized them. They don't feel necessary. They don't feel important. In fact, they feel dangerous. And so, well, the problem with that that mentality is God is emotional. So we know in general that emotions are not sinful in themselves. So then you, you when you realize, okay, I'm an emotional person, then we have to go, well, what does God say about it? And what does he model in it? And how do we live lives that are emotionally healthy and mature and holy? And there is, there is a way to do that. And it is not to suppress it. And it is not to make our emotions our God. That's that's really powerful, and and I look at your ministry and what you do, and even the headlines you've made over the last six months, and we'll talk about some of that a little bit in terms of the the baptisms, the spontaneous baptisms at Auburn. You know, you have this passion for Gen Z, and it really is a generation that emotions. It's been a very complicated thing for this generation sure. in light of what culture has fed the generation and what they've grown up with. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because I find it fascinating. You're here helping people navigate and unpack emotion in, a, in an appropriate way. And you've gone through this yourself. And yet this generation needs that so badly. Why are you so passionate about reaching Gen Z? Well, it's funny. So much has been happening. I've been on several college campuses, have had several stories of revival. I got to be uh, an observer at Asbury for a little while and tell some stories out of there. So I've been around this revival um, world that's happening. It is just happening. Um, and it's really fun to observe and to be a part of. So I would say people, I think people were like, gosh, you're writing a book about emotions, write a book about revival. Like we're all <laughs> sitting on the edge of our seat and I'm going, okay, that's fun to think about and talk about. But at the end of the day, like this generation, it makes me cry. Um, they're really stuck. <laughs> They're really stuck and they need help. And I'm a mama. And when I see it, you know, yes, I want them to have Jesus and I will preach the gospel every time I get in front of them. I will call for repentance every time I get in front of them. I will, I will do the work of an evangelist and a revivalist. I will do that job because that is the core of who I am and I want to see it happen. But they also need to know how to navigate a very very complicated world and it's only going to get more complicated and they need to know how to navigate that in a way that is biblical but also really helpful and and I think just throwing verses at them and being like I just wish they would be more holy I wish they would get off technology I wish they would work harder I wish they would. it's just not helping they are broken they have lived through already in their lifetime more than most of us have and so we've got to tend their souls and Jesus did this right like I'm very very confident about the work I'm doing in every front. My books will be sold in Target, a lot of them. And unbelievers will pick them up and boys will pick them up and girls will pick them up and all different types of people will pick them up. And I believe that's the work of Jesus. He also brought bread to people. He also helped their eyesight. He also helped their physical ailment. He also helped them when they felt purposeless and hopeless. They get, he gave them a mission. So I'm such a believer in holistic discipleship that we don't just stop at giving them Jesus. We give them Jesus and then we show them how to walk with him. And yeah. so this is part of that story for me. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, you know, obviously it was really interesting as an observer of you observing and being at Auburn and, and seeing those hundreds of spontaneous baptisms. I think you were baptizing and helping baptize you know, these young people for over two hours. I mean, can you, can you talk about that particular experience and any of the other ones around it, but that really stuck out to a lot of people. Yeah, it was pretty incredible night and we didn't plan it. Um, we were, I just finished and done, uh, you know, gospel, I shared the gospel and got off and just really candidly, there wasn't like a massive response to the gospel in that moment, but I did sense the spirit was moving and I get off the stage and someone walked up to me and said, Hey, this is, it was a pastor. 
And he said, listen, it's so great. This girl just texted me and said, I want to be baptized tonight. And I just said, hey, could we, where are you going to do that? And he said, a pool. And I said, could we think bigger? Could we, could we find something bigger? And he said, there's a lake down the street, but it's like a half a mile away, a mile away. I said, do you think they would come? And he said, well, we can, we can try. So I literally just got back up on stage. The worship was going. We were wrapping up the night. And I just said, would anybody want to be baptized tonight? And dozens of hands went up. And so we, we said, well, we're going to go down to the lake. And I mean, everybody came. There were actually, they picked up people on their way. There were 6,000 people on there. And I mean, it was just wrapping the entire lake and it's a pretty big lake, three, four rows deep. It was wild. And they stayed. We were there till almost midnight before we just said, Hey, you know, we're going to call it. But, but I mean, we were, it was amazing. And hearing the kids, like every single kid said something different, but one of the things they said, um, consistently was, you know, we would ask them, you know, what, why are you here? Why do you want to do this? And, and just make sure they understood the gospel before we did this. And they, so many of them said this, they said, I'm, I want to be clean. I want to be clean. And, and so, you know, I just think that's, that's their longing. And, you know, we're going to have to, we're just going to have to, you know, this is old news. Every generation has judged the younger generations, but let's not. <laughs> No. And and I love, I love that you're addressing it because God gave us emotions for a reason. And I think it's easy to just dismiss them, but they're clearly part of who he is, as you were saying, and part of how he designed us to be. The book is Untangle Your Emotions, Naming What You Feel and Knowing What to Do About It. Jenny, appreciate your time today. You bet. Thank you so much for having me, Billy. You can get Jenny's new book, Untangle Your Emotions, wherever books are sold. We'll be right back in just a moment with more Newsmakers. That's all for Newsmakers. Thank you for watching and be sure to head over to the CBN News YouTube channel. That's where you'll find the full interviews you saw on today's episode. Plus, you can check out our new Daily Newsmakers podcast. It's Monday through Friday. We feature one full interview every single day. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. As for this show, we'll see you again next week.